watch in on our website. So people maybe watch. There'll be some. There's already, as you can see, some oh, waiting room. Lovely. But others like to watch just from fabulous like, on the website. Yeah, fabulous. So I'm going to let everybody in so we can get started in about a minute. Amazing. And I will introduce you and hand it over. Fantastic. Well, good afternoon, everyone. It is 12 o'clock, which means the broadcast has already started on our website. And so I want to welcome everyone to uh, the beginning of our June Lunch and Learn series on LGBTQ plus inclusion uh, and begin with the rejoinder that there are a lot of different ways you can spin those letters and a lot of different ways you can choose which letters to include, which is why I love the plus sign because it's LGBTQ and then everything else. And there's a lot that we will go over over the next five weeks together to talk about that. But um, I also wanna to say to everyone who is joining us today, happy pride. Today is June 1st, the first day of June, the first day of pride month. And we have a very special guest with us today who is gonna begin our celebration of pride and begin our learning as a community as we think about what are some of the issues that a modern day congregation should be thinking about in terms of LGBTQ plus inclusion? We have with us today Rabbi Michael Bakiel, uh, who uses both he, him, and they, them pronouns. Uh, and Micah serves as Keshet's Director of Education and Training. For those of you who don't know from Keshet, Keshet is a phenomenal organization supporting the LGBTQ community within the Jewish community and offering support to individuals and institutions like synagogues and Hillel's and other, other organizations uh, around the country. This is what I'm hoping is going to be the beginning of a wonderful partnership between Temple Bethel and Kesha. We've already had some really wonderful congregation, uh, congregations, conversations to get us to today. Uh, he has served as the coordinator of community chaplaincy with Jewish Family Services in St. Louis, has done spiritual care for individuals around that community. He holds a BA in Islamic and Near Eastern Studies from Wash U in St. Louis and was ordained at the Jewish Theological Seminary in New York. Uh, in addition to his work, he enjoys cooking and baking, living with his family in St. Louis, his wife, Aviva. There are four children and they're assorted pets, which if you want to share what that assorted means, uh, I'm sure people would be interested to know what that is. Um, our session today is both in Zoom and is also being simulcast on our website and on YouTube. Uh, and so uh, obviously those of you who are joining with us on Zoom will have the opportunity to participate a little more actively. And if you're watching online, you are also in for a treat. I am gonna ask for everyone who is joining us that while you're not actively participating, while you're not speaking, we ask that you turn your microphones uh, on mute and keep them that way. Um, that way there's any background noise that won't get in the way of what's going on. But obviously everyone who is in the Zoom room is welcome to unmute themselves and contribute as they would like. Uh, and with that, Rabbi Micah, I am handing it over to you uh, to teach us this conversation today uh, on allyship and inclusion in the Jewish community. So welcome so much. We're so happy to have you. Amazing, amazing. Thank you so much, Rabbi Weissman. Oh, and you shifted it from uh, gallery view, which is so helpful. Um, I am so thrilled to be with you this morning. Um, I'm calling you from St. Louis. Um, as Rabbi Weissman chair, my name is Rabbi Micah Bakiel. I use he, him, and they, them pronouns, and I'm the Director of Education and Training with Keshets, and we work for LGBTQ equality and Jewish life across the United States. I'm really excited to see uh, a handful of folks in this room that I've learned with before in the past. I'm really excited to see a handful of folks in this room that I haven't had the opportunity to meet yet. Um, and I'm really excited to know who it is who's um, you know, joining us from, from simulcast on the website or over YouTube. I think um, it's kind of, uh, kind of fun to be seen in multiple places at once. Um, so I wanna share with you a little bit about what we're gonna do today before I pop up any visuals. I'm a visual learner, so I also tend to be a visual teacher. Um, but I would like to just give a quick overview. I'm going to share not a ton of text study, but a couple of Jewish texts that have really been foundational for me um, as a committed and observant Jew, as a conservative rabbi, as a queer and trans person, um, and sort of a person who really seeks to go through the world as a whole human being, right? Doing whatever it is that my work in front of me is. So I want to share a couple of those foundational pieces of Jewish text with you. Um, I want to spend some time building a shared vocabulary around LGBTQ identities, knowing that this is just the very beginning of an ongoing conversation. There's going to be a tremendous amount of learning as part of this series that hopefully will sort of build on and use 
those, um, those shared foundations. And I wanna offer um, one framework that I think is really helpful when digging into what does this work mean in community and how do we build communities that are places of equity and places of dignity for everyone. A um, couple quick things I wanna say about logistics. I am somebody who does watch the chat um, and I am somebody who wants folks to participate a lot and who wants folks to participate in as many different ways, whichever avenue feels more comfortable. Uh, so if it is better for you to come off mute and just speak up, please do it. Um, we're lucky we're sort of um, a small number of folks in the Zoom room right now. So I will actually be able to see you if you're trying to uh, catch my attention for me to pause. Um, and if for some reason I don't, please just say, hey, I have a question and I will pause and I will honor that question. You can also put something in the chat. I will read it. Um, and if there is a question that you want to ask that you're not sure you want sort of out there in front of everyone that you're the one who asked, you can private chat that to me and I will address the content of the question without sharing who it was who asked. Uh, so all of those are potential ways to be part of this space. So should we dig in? Let's do it. All right. Um, again, visual person, so I am going to bring up some slides, um, and I'm going to bring up just, just the portion of my screen that is slides, because I think that's where it's most helpful. And I'm going to reorient and reorganize my screen just a moment so that I can bring the chat up as well. All right, amazing. I can see you, I can see my slides, and I can see the chat. We are good to go. Um, I will also say this is a very brief overview of considerations because we could have this conversation for two hours, for three hours, for a full day. Sometimes we do have this conversation for six hours. Um, not over Zoom in one chunk anymore, but, but we make it work. Um, and Rabbi Weissman already shared a little bit about who we are at Keshet, and he shared a little bit about our work in education and training, which is what I do. We believe that um, people truly want to make communities that live out their values, the sorts of values that we hear about being a Hamish community, where we are a home for everyone who shows up, uh, communities that want to live into the value of treating all people with dignity. And we believe that having information and concrete tools are going to get us there. So that's education and training. We also have a youth programming department where we create youth-led youth -led spaces and programs where LGBTQ youth can feel seen and valued. Um, and we have a community mobilization department that works to mobilize the Jewish community for LGBTQ rights nationwide in the United States. Um, and if you're curious about any of those other areas that we do, please talk to me afterwards. I'm happy to connect you up. Um, but now I wanna share with you a little bit of my why. Um, and these are texts that have really been um, formative texts for me, as I said, as a, as a human being, as a rabbi, um, as someone who just goes through the world trying to, trying to live with, with dignity and with kindness. Um, so the first, this is something that actually has made its way into Keshet's set of seven Jewish values for communities of dignity. Um, but we talk about this notion of each person being the Tzelem Elohim, right? We go back to um, for those who really enjoy geeking out over text, the first version of the creation story. Um, and we have this notion that God is sort of talking to God's self and saying, you know, let's make the human in our image and in our likeness, and then does so and creates the human in God's image, in God's likeness. Um, and, you know, we can sort of step back and ask, okay, so why, right? Why tell a story about creation at all? Why tell a story that directly links human beings to God's image or likeness? What does it mean for God to have an image or a likeness, right? What does that say theologically? All of these are really big questions. Um, but one of the things that I draw out of that is I'm always interested in the and then what, right? If we meet and we connect and you are in God's image and you are in God's image and you are in God's image, um, what am I supposed to learn from that? And how am I supposed to treat you? So I take it as a given that then that gives me not just sort of like a beautiful but somewhat fluffy idea uh, that feels nice, but it actually gives me a set of real and concrete obligations. Um, and that's often some of my language as a, as a conservative rabbi is that sometimes, sometimes religion is about things might take work. Things might push me beyond my comfort zone. Things might actually create obligation when I would rather, you know, sit and watch Netflix. Uh, as much as I, as I love doing that, right? And so what is the particular obligation that comes out of this notion of every single person that I meet is in the image of God? And what is the obligation 
that comes out of knowing myself as someone who's created in the image of God? Those are the questions that I start to ask about this text. And actually, I'm going to pause for some responses before, before I zip us through to the next one. What does some of this raise for you? Judy, you look like you're speaking, but you're muted. I'm not trying to call you out. If, um... No, my, my reaction was I accept, I accept what you just said. I, I'm reading mm. it and I accept it. Mm. Amazing. Amazing. Right, we've got a story, um, and this is what my, my rabbi and teacher would call a master story, right, or a core story that shows us not only um, something about history or something about imagined history, but something about how the world is supposed to work. Um, never being content with just looking at the words of the Torah and saying, check, that's it. Um, the rabbis of the Mishnah, these are a group of rabbis who are living... Um, in the first century CE, this text is codified or between the year 200 and 220. Um, and they have conversation after conversation about what do we do and how do we do it? The way that I like to think about it is this is a generation of people whose um, world became completely unrecognizable to them, right? That the, that sort of forcibly temple-based Judaism ended at the hands of the Roman army um, after a long period of all sorts of other factors happening. Um, and the, the driving question for them was, well, how do we go about being Jewish? How do we go about being a people, a civilization, a community in a world that is unrecognizable and in which sometimes the way that the Torah tells us to do things, literally that place isn't there anymore. So then what? Um, and in the middle of this list of rules, they, they have this gorgeous statement and they say the following. They say it was for this reason that the human was first created as one person, Ha'adam, to teach you that anyone who destroys a life is considered by scripture to have destroyed an entire world and anyone who saves a life, it is as if they saved an entire world. And I'm gonna pause for a moment and I'm curious because there are some circles in which this, this quote gets, gets quoted and cited a lot. Um, and there are a couple of different translations of it or textual versions of it. And sometimes people get into a little controversy of what exactly does it mean? But I'm curious, is this a text that resonates for you or a text that you've seen elsewhere? And Tracy's nodding, Judy's nodding, Rabbi Weissman's nodding, right? Um, what a lot of folks don't hear, even when we really widely quote or even argue about that First one is that the text goes on to list three other reasons, three other lessons we're supposed to get from that creation story, right? Lesson one that I skipped in that little ellipsis. Yes, also shared by Islam. Yes, 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 yes. Uh, so one reason that is skipped is that it's to prevent any person from being able to say, well, my ancestors are greater than yours. Because you take it back far enough, we have the same ancestors. Reason number three is to um, essentially to combat polytheism, right? That if all of us come from one ancestor, that means that only one deity created humanity, right? That's sort of their theological or polemic reason. And then reason four is the reason I've quoted here and they close with it, right? They like to put their most poetic or their strongest idea at the end. And they say, and also it's to express the grandeur of the Holy One, blessed be God. For a human strikes many coins from the same die and all the coins are alike. But the ruler, the sovereign of sovereigns, the holy one, blessed be God, strikes every human from the die of the first human. And yet no person is quite like their friend. Therefore, every person must say, for my sake, the world was created. Gorgeous, right? Poetic, beautiful. I could run with it and say, oh, this feels lovely. I'm happy all day. Um, Actually, I want to dig at it a little bit, right? When we combine this text with the other one, when we think about everyone is created in the image of God, everyone is created in the image of God from a single common ancestor. And what we are supposed to learn is that the differences between us are what make us sacred, holy, dignified. Uh, the differences between us, the uniqueness of each person is how God's glory gets seen in the world. Um, that actually, for me, shifts a little bit the narrative. I am not particularly interested, and I love to say this during Pride Month, 
right? I am not particularly interested in the argument that I'm just like you, except for this one little detail, so you can treat me with dignity, right? I'm not all that interested in that type of argument for poor dignity. What I am interested in is you're right. I'm not just like you. And that means we have something interesting to learn from one another. I am not just like you. And that means my particularities get to be part of the story. My identities are also part of the human story, part of the Jewish story, part of God's story. Um, Mm, exercising restraint, not going down the path where I tell you actually what context this text comes in because it does something else cool to it. I'm going to let it sit. Um, but if you're interested in a really cool conversation, um, follow that citation at the bottom, Mishnah Sanhedrin 4 or 5, and realize what else they're talking about. And it, it might make you go, oh, wow, even stronger, even cooler. But I'm going to pause and take reactions to the text as it is. I'm thinking about how maybe do we activate this text or this story um, as we, oh, and there I accidentally moved us forward to the next one, gesturing a little bit too enthusiastically. Um, we can go back. How do we take the divine image story with us as we celebrate pride, as we, as we do the work? Yeah, Rabbi. So I'm sitting with this, and I, you know, obviously know these teachings and and have taught them before. But what I love about the way you pull this apart is the thought experiment that you just push back again, which is not, and we're all the same except for this one little thing. But what you're, what this is really saying is, it's because of our differences. It's because that we are made from this single die, but made but Salam Elohim in the way that God intended us to be. It's the uniquenesses that we each carry, that is the source of where our dignity emanates from. Not that we're the same, but actually that we are each our own individual human being. That's what makes us dignified. And that's, what's the, that's what demands the dignity that we each deserve. Not yes. because we all are similar, but because we are different. The differences oh is where the dignity rests. Beautiful. Absolutely yes. beautiful. Yes. And I think about sort of, there's a conversation that happens um, in some version of the LGBTQ community most years as we approach pride, which is sort of what should a pride celebration look like? Um, who quote unquote belongs and who doesn't? Who quote unquote should represent the LGBTQ community to the broader world and who quote unquote shouldn't? Um, and there's sort of a sense of sometimes, and I think a very real history of marginalization um, and oppression leads a lot of people to want to sort of show, to use that argument that, you know, we're just like you except for who we love. Therefore, right, because of our sameness, this is why we deserve respect. And I think it's actually really important to push back and say, you know, I want, I want pride to be a place where every single one of us shows up exactly as we are, right, where any one of us no, none of us has to represent the LGBTQ community and any one of us could, right? Um, or any one of us couldn't equally, <laughs> right? Which is maybe a little bit more accurate. Um, but I want the sort of more out there, maybe a little bit grittier, uh, maybe a little bit more real celebration of identities because of this notion of what it means. Um, and I'm going to take us a little bit forward. I'm going to take us to a piece of text that maybe people don't think of as having, you know, authority in the same way when, that people do when they would look at Torah or Mishnah, these sort of legal documents. But I actually want to take us to our, to our Siddur, our daily prayer book. Um, and there is a line that we say, or a lot of lines that we say every single day before we read Shema. And what we're doing, among other things, um, trying to work ourselves up to that key moment in the morning prayer, but we're envisioning what would the angelic community look like? How is it, you know, what do the angels do when they're standing around in a pot? And it's plastic, it 
the, the cadence and the meter is gorgeous when you say it in Hebrew, but here's what it boils down to. All of them are beloved. All of them are choice or chosen. All of them are mighty. All of them carry out in awe the will of their creator. All of them open their mouth in holiness and purity with song and melody they bless and praise and glorify and exalt and sanctify and declare the power of the name of God, the great, mighty, and awesome ruler, blessed be God. And here's like, here's where I want to dig in. They all receive the yoke of the kingdom of heaven from one another, and they lovingly bestow upon one another reshoots, permission or authority even, thus sanctifying their creator with serenity of spirit, with pure and pleasant speech, they all answer holiness to one another, declaring as one in awe, kadosh, kadosh, kadosh. Holy, holy, holy is Adonai of hosts. The fullness of the earth is God's glory. Um, and to me, there's something really powerful about this notion of like, the angels have a way that they build community. And, and we're sort of, we're, we're striving, we're envisioning, we're aiming for that when we come together in prayer. And I love this reciprocity of it, right? That we've got as this, as this beginning moment that they're all beloved and chosen and mighty and that they receive their ol malchut shemaim, their yoke of the kingdom of heaven from each other, right? Why not from God, right? These are literally the angels standing in front of God. Why doesn't God give them the yoke of the kingdom of heaven? Well, they give it to each other and they bestow authority. They bestow reshoot, permission, uh, that could even be translated as like dominion or rulership if you wanted to, although I think in this context that makes less sense. Um, and again, it's that, it's that reciprocity. It's what happens between people that makes a community sanctified. Um, and so again, when I do this work, the questions that come up are, all right, this is amazing. How do we build communities where we bestow upon each other that reshoot, that dominion, that authority? And how do we build communities where this sort of, this sacred obligation, this yoke of the kingdom of heaven, where it comes from one another. Um, and that's sort of, that's the work that I'm most interested in doing. And I'm gonna pause again for, for reactions or thoughts or engagements with this little bit of, these little snippets of text. And Rabbi, I, I saw that you went and you grabbed the book off the shelf. And so now I'm curious. I was just looking at the context and, you know, for those of, for those in, in, in our community for whom the traditional weekday morning Yotzer is not the most familiar. Um, I, I'm guessing that to some of you, the words Kadosh, Kadosh, Kadosh uh, are familiar, right? As part of the, as part of the Amidah, but there's actually earlier in the service, there's an earlier rep repetition of those words. And some of the scholars said that the rabbis put it in there so that if you're, if you're davening alone, you have an opportunity to say those words because you need a minion. But I love this, you know, that has nothing to do with what Rabbi just taught us, which is about what actually, what, what, what does this teach us about the mutual respect and mutual awe and relationship between the, the holy beings, the, the holy angels, what they had with and for each other in this moment, even in the presence of the Holy One. So I'm just sort of marinating with that a little bit. Mm. Mm. Amazing. Amazing. I really like the word friend or friendship in the previous slide, um, that we can find friendship in the differences and, and that it creates the understanding because I think that is often lacking these days. And so in the next, if you go yeah back to the one with the angels, I see that it, it almost embodies that friendship, right? The respect that they're giving each other and the care and the, uh, and the attention. Right. Right, and even that word at the beginning, right? Kulam ahuvim, all of them are beloved, right? And it's, you know, yes, one can say that sort of like in God's regard, all of them are beloved and chosen and mighty and that's sort of where that comes from. Um, but I really do see it being embodied sort of one to the other. Um, and I think that's, that's something powerful. And that is something that I think in a lot of concrete and real ways we can strive for. Um, and I will say, go, 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 go. I was going to say, it's, it's community. It's yes. 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 And I think, like, I also think a little bit of um, Dr. King and his doctrine of beloved community and sort of really being able to name out in very concrete ways. And I will say also not in like sort of, 
of fluffy feel good ways, but sometimes in difficult and thorny and challenging ways. Um, what does it mean to sort of take this notion of being beloved and and being chaverim, sort of friends, connected teachers, students of one another, and giving one another this um, this authority? Um, it's not easy work, but it's sacred sacred work and it's real work. Mm. Um, and I think I'll share one last thing before I sort of move us into um, a little bit less of this text land and a little bit more into this land of let's get some common vocabulary, let's understand a little bit about some of these identities, uh, let's prepare to continue learning together. Um, for me, part of why these texts is particularly formative is, you know, you'll notice that none of these texts say anything about gender or about sexual orientation or about personal identity. Um, and I will say for a lot of folks who are LGBTQ Jews, um, many of us begin our wrestling within Judaism, really starting by asking the questions of what does the tradition say about me? Am I permitted or am I not permitted? Or sort of what does the sort of Jewish legal or halachic framework, how does it address me? Um, and seeking for, for quotes that in particular say, yes, you may exist. Um, and I think it's incredibly important to be doing that work. And I'm really deeply invested in folks who are engaged sort of in that Jewish legal system to be really thinking deeply and sometimes in um, challenging or, or different or new ways about how we uh, engage with some of the texts that Judaism has that have been weaponized often against LGBTQ people. But I think it's also important that we step outside of the questions of who gets to exist and start with, once we assume that people exist, right? Once we know that these identities are real, how do we think about how our communities are gonna be shaped? And what does it mean to see every person as a person of worth and dignity and to know kulam ahuvim, right? That, that sort of this, this sense of being beloved is not subject to debate. And so for me, I don't know, I would say that in some ways these are almost like healing texts in addition to being inspiring texts. Um, so I want to name that. Oof, with that, and I think I'm going to skip that think pair share. We've got a, a small group of folks, so I'm going to do a little bit of the Aleph bets, um, and then I'm going to share with you this framework that I talked about. So the LGBTQ Aleph bets, terms and concepts. Um, I want to share with you a big picture concept that's going to carry through everything that we talk about today. And I actually think through a lot of the learning that's going to happen over the next month. And that's the concept of a binary. Um, and I know there are already some keywords here on the slide. So you see that it says opposite, mutually exclusive, two and only two. But I'm curious, does anyone have a, a definition that you're used to using of the word binary? Or a sense of how that might play out when we we're talking about I guess when we view things as either or instead of a both and. Mm. Yeah, either or instead of both and. Yes. Which I actually want to take that back because the both and is also sort of a binary in and of itself. <laughs> but when, <laughs> I said that it sounded good and then I was like, no, that's <laughs> terrible. But, but when we really try to put things in boxes that, that are fixed. Mm. Yes, yes. I want to pick up on that, this sort of notion of putting things in boxes, right? We are going through a really complicated and messy world all the time. Um, and a shortcut that we take, because we cannot process every piece of input we get individually without connecting it to something else without categorizing it, we start putting things into categories. And a lot of times it's really useful, right? Um, if you think about, for example, the elevator at a major hotel or office building, and you think about the elevator at um, an older New York apartment building, like with the metal grate that still slides across the front, right? Those are two things that in a lot of ways are pretty different. And if we didn't have the ability to categorize them and say, they're both serving the same function, I can 
learn how to interact with one based on interacting with the other, life might take a little bit more time, right? If we had to relearn, it's for going up and down and here's what the buttons do and here's how to you know, get in and out and know when I'm gonna get to my floor each and every time. So it's good that we can make categories. Where it can become challenging is when those categories become binary categories, when they become categories where we think that they are opposites, when we think that they're two and only two, and we think that they're mutually exclusive, right? That's a little bit like saying, well, an elevator is quote unquote, the opposite of stairs. I mean, not really, right? There are two among many tools for getting from one floor to another of a building, but in what ways are they opposites? Not really. Um, so I wanna do a quick little exercise sort of showing both how common binary either ors are in like 21st century North American culture. And also um, thinking a little bit about the ways in which while they're not always inherently bad, they often fall short. Um, so I'm gonna tell you something. I want you to tell me the opposite um, or what you think the opposite is supposed to be. You can come off mute. You can put it in the chats. Um, so if we get ice cream today, do you eat chocolate or? Vanilla. Vanilla. Mm, vanilla. We've got some folks vanilla, right? Is this play a comedy or a? Tragedy. 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 Is that the hero or the? Villain. The villain. Are you a cat person or a? Dog. Dog person. So I have two related questions for you. One, how easy was it to figure out what was supposed to be the opposite? I see some folks nodding. I see some of the like side to side. Okay. There's sort of a often in a commonly understood set that these, is how, these are how the categories work. Vanilla and chocolate are the kinds of ice cream, et cetera. Um, how true or complete were those either ors? Rabbi Weitzman's shaking his head. Tracy's shaking her head. Right? I will never choose the vanilla or the chocolate ice cream, right? If I go into the shop or the, or the grocery store, there are, there are three or four flavors that are my favorite, but neither of them is vanilla or chocolate, right? I have, you asked about the assortment of pets. So we have two dogs, a big dog and a small dog, and there's a chinchilla in the house and there's a pet snake in the house. In the past, I had lizards, skinks and bearded dragons and all sorts of things. Um, and I would also say, yeah, I'm a dog person, right? Those stereotypes they fit me well and I enjoy, and I'm happy. Um, but that doesn't sort of define everything. And it's not the opposite of any other category, right? That you could say, are you a cat person or a dog person? Well, the answer is neither, or the answer could be both, or the answer could be um, so a different kind of pet, or the answer could be, well, I have cats, but don't call me a cat person, right? That's a stereotype and that doesn't match how I think of myself, right? That binary, we, we often have the ability to identify what it's supposed to be and then to step back and say, oh, but also it falls short. So my invitation is <clears throat> that when we are talking identity in really big core ways, we think about it a little bit like that. They could be categories that mean a lot to certain people. They can be categories that have you know, positive ways of connecting folks to one another around shared identity. And when we assume they have to be either or, when we start deciding who gets access to what based on those categories, oh. well, it starts to fall apart. So particularly I'll say when we think about gender, but also when we think about pretty much any other identity category, if we can take it out of that binary and think a little bit more expansively, think a little bit more about maybe a constellation. I think we're gonna do better. That's my big picture concept number one. My big picture concept number two that I wanna share with you is that um, 
none of us is ever just one thing at a time, right? Anytime we show up in a space, we show up with all of our identities at once. We show up with race and class and language. We show up with culture and religion and sexual orientation and gender and ethnicity and age and ability and disability, all of it, right? We are whole people all of the time. So when we're talking about LGBTQ identities, I want us to hold on to that. I want us to remember that the LGBTQ community, you know, we are a multiracial and multi-ethnic community. We are a community of people who might be religious, secular, anywhere in between. We are people who might be English speakers or speak other language. We might be citizens and not people. And all of those identities are there at the same time. Um, and so thinking about sort of what does, quote, the LGBTQ community need, it can be really helpful because there are some commonalities. And let's watch for remembering that we're a community that has a lot of variety as well. All right, zooming in. I know that we've been, I've been talking at you for a minute. I have a couple more slides that are building common vocabulary. Then we're going to get a little more interactive. We're going to start using a framework for sort of the and then what. So when we talk about identity related to the LGBTQ community, we're talking about three different axes of identity. We're talking about sex assigned at birth, which is different from gender identity, which is different from sexual orientation. And these are three independent categories of identity and I would say most people, LGBTQ or not, have something, some identity or some label that could be uh, assumed on all three of those axes. So what do I mean by that? Well, I just threw a lot of words on the board there for you. Tracy, you're noting we usually do this a little bit more slowly. <laughs> um, but when we're talking about sex assigned at birth, we're talking about all this stuff that happens when other people put us into categories based on how they perceive our bodies, right? It's usually a medical person. They usually do this, you know, when, a, when, a, when there's an ultrasound or when a baby is born, they take a look at external anatomy and they make a declaration, right? It's a boy or it's a girl. Well, they, they find that you born into um, categories of male or female. Um, I will also note that the intersex community, about a half to one and a half percent of humans have biology that defies this sort of common understanding of, of sex assigned at birth as a simple binary. And a lot of those people do get forcibly assigned to one or the other of those categories. Um, and there's a lot, there's been tremendous activist work happening in the intersex community to really defend bodily autonomy and really defend and um, people getting to live healthy lives in their own bodies is more important than someone else's comfort with what someone's body might look like. So that's sex assigned at birth. And all that is different than gender identity, um, which is this internal sense, right? It's what you know in your gut, in your soul, in your kishkas, um, a sense of self. And that's when we start to see words like like gender queer or woman or man or non-binary or gender fluid. These are words that don't have anything to do with bodies and no sort of external authority with a clipboard and a, and a set of check boxes can walk up to somebody else and perceive gender identity, right? It comes from inside. And the last thing I'll say about gender is that while sex assigned at birth and gender identity are completely independent of each other, right? They do not cause one another, they do not shape one another. Um, depending on their relationship, there are a lot of ways in which we navigate the world differently uh, based on the relationship between those two categories. So when somebody's gender identity happens to be the same as what was assigned to them by somebody else at birth, uh, we might describe that experience as being cisgender. Cis is a prefix that means on the same side. And when somebody's gender identity happens to be something other than what was assigned to them by somebody else at birth, we might describe that experience as being transgender. Trans is a prefix that means across or beyond. 
Um, and when we talk about cisgender and transgender, this is an area where we saw, start to see a lot of very real implications in terms of who has access to what, how people navigate and receive adequate health care, uh, where discrimination might or might not happen in housing and employment and communities, right? All sorts of things sort of from large to small. Um, we see a lot of impacts in how the world is built on the basis of assuming particular relationships between gender and sex assigned at birth. Um, I do see a question that came into the chat and I am going to get there. I have some thoughts on it for um, the person who asked it, but I do want to pause and ask about the sort of gender side of the triangle. I want to check in um, if folks have questions about those terms, if we feel like we've built sort of uh, enough toeholds to have a common vocabulary moving forward. I see a couple of nods. All right, we're there. Um, and if you do have any questions, feel free to chat them, feel free to ask them at any time. Um, when we get to this other point of the triangle, sexual orientation, we're talking about whether, how, and to whom a person experiences romantic or physical attraction. Um, and that's where we start to see words like, and you'll see that some of these uh, words have the first letter bolded, right? So L, G, B, T is for the transgender over on the gender side and Q. We start to see words like lesbian and gay. Straight is a, is a sexual orientation. Bisexual and queer, asexual and pansexual are all orientations that we might see. Um, so the question that came through anonymously in the chat is about... Um, monogamy and polyamory and whether there is um, any overlap between the LGBTQ community and the polyamorous community. And I, I'm sort of like maybe taking as extension from this sort of whether that um, plays into how we talk about these identities. Um, so what I'll say is that the axis of being um, when we talk about monogamy or, or sort of uh, wired to be in relationship with one person at a time uh, versus polyamory, wired to be in relationship with multiple people at a time. I would actually consider that a different access than um, some of these questions which really relate to who some of the people are that we might experience attraction to. Um, and I would say that many LGBTQ people are um, sort of on the monogamy side, many LGBTQ people are polyamorous and like that doesn't make anybody more or less LGBTQ. That would be how I would answer that. Um, and there may have been more in that question. Feel free to reach out to me privately later. Um, but I'm curious if folks have any thoughts on sort of looking at this, this um, big constellation of identity, if folks have any thoughts, questions or responses. I have one that's kind of esoteric and if it's too in the weed, let me know. Um, sure. Having recently welcomed the children in the last five or six years of my life, by the, the story you told of, of the baby being born and then the sex being assigned at that moment, that happened for one of my children. Uh, we waited till, we waited till she was born to decide to, to learn what her, what her sex was. And then our early, or then our second child, uh, had the body the anatomy scan at, at around 20 weeks, which was how we learned the sex of, of her. Um, and then our third child, actually we did the same, but there were other people. No, wait, for the third one, we had a DNA test that was mm. taken at, at 12 weeks. Uh, and I told the whole story because as I'm looking around the crowd of folks who are here today, I'm looking at some folks who, it's been a few years since you've gone through the prenatal process. Um, and so I'm just wondering, you know, the technology has advanced a lot in terms of prenatal care and prenatal testing and prenatal screening. And I'm wondering in the conversation about the, about assigning sex at birth, knowing that part of the purpose of this conversation is to talk about the limits of what that can do, right? That, that it's, it's, it's a piece of someone, but it's not the entirety of someone and recognizing sex assignment versus gender identity is being very, very different in important ways. 
I am curious um, how the DNA part of that testing, uh, of that experience has an effect on assignment and, and particularly when it comes to folks who are intersex. Yeah. And that, if, that's, if that's two in the weeds, say that's two in the weeds and we can talk offline about that later. Um, I mean, I think I'll, I'll address it briefly, which is uh, having more access to more ways of learning about people's body actually has helped us learn that there are a lot more people who are intersex than we otherwise would have thought. Um, and really helps us learn about the shortcomings of being able to say there is one sort of absolute measurable piece of biology that ultimately determines someone's sex. It is very common for uh, external anatomy, internal anatomy, DNA tests, uh, and hormone levels, and the sort of, not obviously in infancy, but among adults, also the sort of secondary sex characteristics, the things that we would look at from a distance, body shape, beard, et cetera. Um, it's really common for those to provide sort of different answers to the question of how to categorize someone if our only two options are male or female. Um, and I think it, it just helps us learn a little bit about how much we don't know, right? People are complicated. Um, and I think that's a good and beautiful thing. And maybe the more we just let people be people um, and have a little bit less invested in how easy it is for an outside observer to categorize that person, um, I'd say that maybe we would all, we'd all benefit from quite substantially. Great. Thank you for, yeah, thank you for asking that. That's a fantastic question. Um, a couple more things that I just wanna to touch on briefly is here are some gender terms for things that are also different from one another. We already talked about gender identity, right? Most it's internally, sometimes from a very young age of who we are in relationship to gender. We also walk through the world expressing ourselves in all sorts of ways, including in terms of gender, right? That when we, when we wake up in the morning, we choose, we make choices about what does our hair look like? What clothing do we wear? What accessories do we choose? How do we speak? How do we move? What are our mannerisms? All of these are things that we might choose to put out into the world that express something to people who share cultural context with us about our genders. Um, and I will note that sometimes they express different things to people who have different cultural contexts, right? That it's highly specific. Um, we also have gender attribution, which is there's this moment where we tend to lose control, right? We put out into the world what we choose using a palette of, you know, ways of expressing ourselves, And then somebody else takes that in and they filter that through their previous experiences, their assumptions, their cultural background. Maybe they're making, maybe they're looking at our body, right? Things that we're not choosing to express. Um, but sort of physical characteristics that we have. And maybe they're applying stereotypes to those and they attribute a gender, right? That's what happens when, um, you know, for example, somebody might say, excuse me, sir, you know, out in public to a stranger out of, an, out of a genuine attempt to be polite and kind and respectful. And they're thinking about somebody's expression in order to do that. And actually we've got this language system that, um, up until very recently, it literally doesn't offer us a way to address a stranger with that level of formal politeness without guessing their gender. Very strange. Um, and the last thing I'll point to is that all of these categories of identity are very different than gender roles or stereotypes, right? That gender roles or stereotypes, a culture's idea of what people of different genders are, quote, supposed to be like, um, some people might pretty comfortably hew pretty close to those stereotypes. Some people might differ from those stereotypes and still very deeply identify with the gender that those stereotypes are applied to. And some people might really deeply experience dissonance with those stereotypes and also be of a different gender than what those stereotypes are typically tied to, right? That those two things aren't the same. Um, and I will note that it can get a little tricky to talk about because for many of us, especially when we're young, some of the first ways we start talking about gender are through the lens of stereotypes and expectations. Um, and so when we're trying to sort out, you know, am I pushing against the stereotypes or does the gender not fit? You know, the answer can be, it's fine, right? It's okay 
to push against the stereotypes and still live in the gender. It's okay to push against the stereotypes and live in a different gender. Um, and we should all be given a little bit more breathing room when it comes to stereotypes, right? That those are things that have impacts on all of us in all sorts of different ways. Ooh. That's what I'm gonna say about identity. And I'm just gonna remind us, hold on to it lightly. Um, I'm sort of like speaking with a lot of command of these terms because I use them a lot. Please don't treat me as the expert on anybody else's identity, right? If, if somebody else tells you what a particular word means to them, they are right. Uh, even if it happens to contradict the way that I defined it for us as a group. Um, and identity is fun and complicated and big. And Rabbi Weissman, you have another question. Well, I, I wanted to add to that because as I was sitting here and, and learning, I was thinking about Jewish identity in much the same way, yes. right? Which is that, in, in, in Rabbi, if you actually, if you want to put this, this slide back one to look at what we just showed, right? <clears throat> Jewish identity, Jewish expression, Jewish attribution, Jewish roles and stereotypes. Like for me, it resonated like what, well, like as, as 21st century religiously progressive Jews who live in the world, like how many of us have at one time or another thought about like, is this a thing that Jews do? Is that person being Jewish and what they're doing? Am I playing into Jewish stereotypes? Is it okay? Cause it's just how I am. And I've, I've got the beard. I got like, you know, it's just, it really resonated with me as a really interesting frame, especially for a community like ours, who is entering into this conversation and looking for a way to wrap our minds around some of the, these ideas of identity. Not that it's a one-to-one, -one, but there is an interesting mapping on, of, of one onto the other, which is as a Jewish person, I express that in certain ways and Jews express their Judaism differently. And yes. other people think things about me because I'm Jewish or not, or they presume, or I'm, I mean, all those things. And it really, 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 uh, if I were to teach this again, I would, I would use that as a, as, mm. a, as, a, as an interesting frame, especially for Jews who are entering into this conversation around gender, because I think it's, there's a lot that we experience in our world. Yes, and it is so important to be able to, like, while holding room for the differences and particularities, it becomes really important to draw some analogies. That's how, like, that's how empathy works, right? Not to say I'm just like you, but to be able to say, I can imagine something in my story that helps me hear your story a little bit better. And that's actually where I want to take us in our last few minutes as we start to put it into practice, right? I cannot resist the, the urge to give you an, another piece of text. So um, you know, the, the sages have this question, another binary question, right? Is study or action greater? And they conclude, yes, right? Study is greater than action, but only because study leads to action. So I, I kind of love that they say, don't make me choose an either or. Um, but we're going to start thinking a little bit about action. Um, and one framework for allyship. There are so many different pieces that could go into allyship and we've been working on all sorts of training materials around allyship, uh, but one of them is really out and address spoken norms and systems. So I'm bringing you a quote for Let's Talk About Race by Ijima Lo, which is um, not talking about LGBTQ identities at all, right? But um, I, I would say that the LGBTQ um, Activism and work in the world has a tremendous amount to learn from anti-racist work and owes a tremendous depth in particular to, I will say, Black feminism when thinking about how do we approach systems of power. Um, so it's with that that I'm going to share with you her quotes. And she says, every time you go through something and it's easy for you, look around and say, who is it not easy for and what can I do to dismantle the system? Right, that anytime we are together in a system, there's often... Um, some form of unspoken system or unspoken norm or even unspoken rule that's going to be enforced that helps define who is the we, right? Who is this designed for? Um, so one story that I love to tell, and I'm going to tell it because, you know, you took us there, Rabbi. Um, my wife used to work for one of the city halls in St. Louis. We have 94 different municipalities, so I'm not giving away who this employer <laughs> was, um, but every year in December, they would put up this huge display for quote unquote, the holidays. And their holiday display was a 12 foot tall Christmas tree with ornaments and lights and a train full of presents with Santa driving it. And everything was like, I mean, this is, this was massive, right? 
And one year, she asked the city manager, um, after another employee approached her and said, you know, could we put up a menorah? She asked the city manager, could we put up a menorah next to the Christmas tree? And the answer was, no, of course not. We can't put religious symbols in city hall because of separation of church and state. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. True story. Why? How, how could that sentence possibly happen? Because often when an identity is sort of centered and empowered in a particular way, it gets to be thought of as neutral, right? So there was this idea, this unspoken idea that, yeah, Christmas trees are the thing for the holidays, plural. They're universal. They apply to everybody. Jewish symbols are religious and specific and different, right? That, that, that sense of one thing is the norm and the other thing gets accommodated. So too, and we could talk a lot about the ways that this plays out with race and racism, if I'm thinking about this quote that I shared, and we can think also a lot about how does this play out with gender and sexuality? What are the things that are sort of the equivalent of that 12 foot tall Christmas tree with regard to gender and sexuality that maybe we don't even notice is a statement about what is neutral or default that might not land the same way to someone who isn't part of that identity. Um, so we call those systems cisnormativity and heteronormativity, right? So cisnormativity is the assumption that being cisgender is neutral or default. Um, and often that, you know, maybe trans people exist or deserve to be respected or should be accommodated as, as a difference from that neutral, right? This is, and, and that's, that's very specifically what I mean. It does not inherently mean being antagonistic towards trans people. It means assuming that the default is cis. Similarly, heteronormativity, it means assuming that the neutral or the default is being straight and Know, knowing that other orientations exist. So that's kind of what's going on when we say, you know, we say weddings when we're talking about a different gender couple, but maybe we talk about a gay wedding when we're talking about a couple of the same gender, right? Because somehow we have to specify the difference from the defaults or else we would assume. So when we have those sort of unspoken norms, well, we build systems that benefit people who match those norms, right? We build buildings that you can only safely use a restroom in if you are cisgender or can be assumed to be cisgender, right? Or we build forms where, you know, you let your guard down and fill out your family information if your family is mother plus father plus children, and you have to start like crossing out and writing in if your family consists of any other arrangements, right? So we build systems that actively benefit some people and actively create barriers for others. And then those systems reinforce what we think the norm is, right? Because then people either are closeted or don't show up. And then we say, well, I, all I see around me is people who match this norm. So it must be the norm, right? So it becomes this self-perpetuating cycle. So the invitation that I want to offer sort of as this learning continues over this month and hopefully beyond is to start to identify where are there moments where something is assumed as the norm and how could we step out of that assumption? How could we communicate everybody's the norm? And Judy, you've got a question. Well, we have male nurses. We have female, right. it's a female doctor, my God, and a female pilot on the plane. Oh my mm -hmm. God, you have to have that norm in front of it, the unusual. Right? Talk to me about being called a lady rabbi. <laughs> right? It's, it's a thing that sometimes we specify what we see as the difference and we don't specify. And that's actually sort of why, why this word cisgender was really coined um, because people would talk about your transgender or your quote unquote regular or normal, right? If there's no word to describe the default identity, then people don't assume that it's a specific identity. People don't assume it's one among many. Yeah, yeah. And our tradition is laden with this. Uh-huh. Our tradition, our tradition and, and forgetting, for, I mean, forgetting all of the modern processes like the intake forms for 
the wedding couple or the priest and all of that, right? Our tradition is based deeply in a language, the Hebrew language, which is deeply gendered. Um, and so, you know, these are things we struggle with. Like, you know, we can talk about having changing the forms for the family, but at the end of the day, there's bar mitzvah and there's bat mitzvah or there's something else. And even with the something else, we still have the normativity of bar and bat that we are going to be struggling against um, as, as a piece of this, because it, 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 it emanates from our tradition. Um, and that's, that's something that is compelling to, to, to wrestle with and a challenge. Yes. And I will say that um, many movements are working really hard to expand our language and to think about what is the terminology we use so that nobody has to feel like the something else, right? See the special section at the back of the book. Um, but really think about all of us as sort of fully part of, of Jewish life. So here are a couple of cool resources around Hebrew and ritual. Kehilat Hadar um, has done a tremendous amount of work as has the Fort Tryon Jewish Center around calling people for Aliyot and using gender expansive language. Um, and the Non-Binary Hebrew Project has worked to create a full grammar system that, uh, again, I always think of adding rather than subtracting. Um, so I think of this as adding gender expansive terms to masculine and feminine terms, which also have value. And that folks should, all, all folks should have the ability to use gendered language that reflects them and speaks to them. And oh my goodness, we zipped through that hour so fast. <laughs> Oh my goodness. Wow. Uh, so there's something that I struggle with at the end of that struggle, but like, so even these beautiful reiterations of, of language leave me wondering if I'm a person who opts for the neutral expression, mm -hmm. and I'm coming at this from, you know, being cognizant of my own identity as, as, as a cis, as a cisgendered heterosexual male, like, to me, it means you're wondering, like, should we be even taking away some of those original iterations? Like, you know, I know there are a lot of kids, for example, who offer, who refer to the, to the experience of coming age as be mitzvah, right? Mm -hmm. um, but what I don't know, and we're not doing it here yet, so I don't know how it plays out, but like, is that in lieu of, or in addition to bar or bat mitzvah, should the family choose? I mean, part of me feels like that if we're going to do this well, we need to be saying that everyone is becoming a B mitzvah. No one is becoming a bar mitzvah or a bat mitzvah, even if you're okay with that, right? Mm -hmm. If your family mm -hmm. would want your child to become a bat mitzvah because that, that descriptor and that identity feels comfortable for you. Right. right. Is it enough to say that we're okay with that? Or do we need to do, do we need to push him far to say that we are taking, we are re-envisioning the whole thing. So as not to even enter into a distinction around gender or, or sex identity from the outset, I don't have an answer to the question. That's the that's the part that I struggle with. Yeah, that's a fantastic question. Um, so, and I think there's also always the dance between doing something the best way and doing something the strategic way in order to begin making steps now. Um, and I want to recognize that a lot of what we are working so hard for right now, this year in 2021, might be things that we look back on on in 2040 and think, "Gosh, that was all." We could have been doing so much better, right? And I think it'll be a good thing when we're able to look back and say like, no, we actually, step by step, we get there. Um, but the way that I think about it is I don't want less gender in the world. I don't want fewer genders in the world. I want more. Um, I want everyone to be able to honor the fullness of who they are and nobody should have to lose out in order to make that happen. So some of what that might look like in terms of reaching the age of mitzvah is, you know, I like when I'm talking generically about the ceremony, I like to talk about reaching the age of mitzvah, simchat mitzvah or bi mitzvah, sort of one of those terms that is gender expansive, that doesn't define a gender. And when I'm talking about an individual ceremony, I'm so happy to say my daughter celebrated her bat mitzvah, my son celebrated his bar mitzvah, right? And those were really powerful moments for them but what I put in the manual, it should say, you know, it should have language that everyone can see themselves in. I am going to have to leave folks with that because yes. we've reached, oh my goodness, we've reached our time. I do want to offer the invitation. I've put my email in the chat, uh, micah.buck.yael at keshetonline.org. I am so happy to continue to answer questions. 
I am so excited to hear how the rest of this learning goes with your community and all the following lunch and learns that you have planned. Ah, amazing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you yeah. so much, Rabbi. And, and before I let you, you know, well, I want to let you go in a moment. So if you need to sign up now, I want to make a few announcements to the members of our community about the rest of the programming for the month. But Rabbi, if you need to jump into your one o'clock, what you're late for, uh, by all means, please. Thank you from the depth of our heart. Thank you so much for teaching us today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And happy pride. Have a wonderful rest of your day and a wonderful rest of your month. Thank Bye. You. Thank you. So for those of uh, the, this conversation will continue over the next four Tuesdays from 12 to one in this space, in the zoom room, and also on our website on YouTube, uh, a few other events going on in the community for pride month that we're participating in this, this Saturday morning, uh, June 5th is the Palm beach pride markets, which is the Palm beach County wide pride festival that's taking place uh, at Bryant park in Lake worth beach. The temple will be having a booth uh, there throughout the, throughout the day. So, uh, we encourage everyone to come to the event and there's going to be artisan artisanry and crafts and it's a family friendly, pet friendly LGBTQ event. Uh, and obviously be sure to stop by the TBE table to get your TBE pride sticker that you can wear probably around the community. Um, on June 18th is going to be our pride Shabbat uh, during Friday night services. And on June 19th, we'll be, we'll be marching in the Stonewall Parade in Wilton Manor's uh, and information about that is up on our website as well. Uh, so with that, I wish everyone a continued uh, happy Pride for the month of June, and I will see you back in the space. Uh, I'll either see you this Saturday or uh, before our Friday, Friday services this Friday nights, or I'll see you next